This is a, a homology three sphere. Um, and it, it's a beautiful exercise to see what its SU2 representation variety is. So, um, <coughs> so what? Yeah. So a nice way to th think about. So we, we need to understand what's the fundamental group of this guy. Um, well, a nice way to access it is to observe that it, there's nearly a fibration. If I think of S1 acting on, <coughs> uh, just as multiplying, sorry, uh, S1 acts on here by multiplying, um, so e to the i theta, Z1, Z2, Z3 is E to the I um, <coughs> QR theta Z1, E to the I PR theta Z2, uh, E to the I uh, PQ theta Z3. So that preserves the equations. Um, we can take the quotient of this guy by uh, by that action, and we get it, it is really an, an orbifold two sphere. So there's an orbifold angle of 2 pi over p, 2 pi over q, 2 pi over r here, and the fundamental group of this orbifold is quite easy to describe. Um, it's a triangle group. So the orbifold fundamental group. <laughs> I probably. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will write larger letters, yes. That's the triangle group TPQR with um, generators TU, TU, and V, so that um, T to the P is equal to U to the Q is equal to V to the R is equal to TUV is equal to 1. <coughs> now, um, the, on the other hand, the, the fundamental group of, so what this tells you is that, um, <coughs> that the fundamental group of these Brieskorn spheres is uh, an extension of the triangle group by, uh, sorry, ex yeah, up by Z. So the fundamental group that we're interested in. So this is a central element and if I look at representations of this into SU2, right, so I look at, look at a row, um, row has to send, uh, so this is central, it has to send that guy to plus or minus the identity. Right? In other words, if I push this representation, the representation I w under study into SU2, if I push it down into SO3, it's just a representation of the triangle group. And um, well, what do I want to say about that? Um, so these guys you can understand. So. Um, so, so rho descends to 
rho tilde mapping T P Q R to S O three. <coughs> and um, you know, no, I'll say it. So um, in SO3, you know, so we're, we're, we're getting is TUV inside SO3 that satisfy this, these relations, right? Now, <coughs> what you can check um, is that um, what you can check is that these guys, um, let me draw the picture here. So these are rotations. So here's the two sphere, not the orbifold two sphere, but just the honest two sphere. Um, so T is a rotation about some axis uh, by uh, 2 pi k over r and uh, et cetera. Right, so the, this, uh, s is a rotation about this axis. Sorry, t u v. These are rotations. And the constraint that you end up getting is that, sorry, let me, you get a spherical triangle if TUV equals 1. You get a spherical triangle. So here, that angle is, is pi k over p, the angle here is pi L over R. The angle here is pi, um, M, sorry, it's Q, R. Um, so this product relation tells you, given this, that there's a spherical triangle with these angles. The sp spherical triangles are rigid. So there's a, a fi up to rigid rotation of SU2, there are a finite number of such guys. There's a, some constraints that come from the areas of, uh, possible areas of the possible triangles that you can get. And um, here you see kind of an amazing um, <coughs> uh, coincidence between, well, I, sh sh I shouldn't have erased that. Um, So the number of such spherical triangles up to rigid motion is equal to minus the signature of the Milner fiber of um, of that singularity. So the Milner fiber, remember we had this picture. There's S5. Here's this equation. Uh, um, now if we give this equation a little kick, Um, then we get, well, if we give it a little kick, that doesn't change too much what happens on the boundary, but we get actually a smooth uh, four-manifold. Um, so if I take this thing, intersect it with V6, that's the Milner fiber. So that's a, a sort of canonical four-manifold that this three-manifold bounds, and there's this beautiful fact which uh, eventually 
you know, several different proofs. But you're, you're already starting to see that, that something, um, you know, that, that kind of, you know, trying to get some kind of feeling for what these representations are doing. And already, just on the level of a, a naive count, you see that this, the, the count of these representations remembers something interesting about a canonical four manifold that that thing bounds. Right? The, that, that was a link of a complex singularity, and somehow the count of these representations tells you something subtle about that, that canonical four manifold that it bounds. So, um, yeah. So I want to show you that there are other interesting connections just looking at representations uh, to other. Uh, other interesting problems. So let me, let me see where the. Yeah, okay. So um, let's take a look at representations of not groups. Where's my eraser? So take the same. So let's take, we're going to look at S3 minus K, um, look at its fundamental group. Maybe I'll call that pi 1 of K for brevity. And then I'm going to look at representations of the fundamental group uh, <coughs> um, of K into SU2. But again, I'm not going to look at arbitrary representations. Um, I'm going to look at so here, here's my, my K. Um, again, we can take, take a base point and then take a meridian for K. Here's K. Here's a meridian. And what we want to look at is representations into SU2 so that rho of a meridian, well, I can write it several different ways. So the trace of rho of a meridian is 0, i.e., rho of meridian. Well, that means its square is minus the identity because it's an SU2. Um, so you know, another way to say it, here's the identity. Here's minus the identity. This is SU2, the three-sphere. And then uh, there's a two-sphere, which I'll call S2i, which is the, the conjugates. Of, that's right, identity. The conjugates of the quaternion i in SU2. Um, so the unit imaginary quaternions, if you like. Um, so. So what happens if we study these guys? So, um, well, it, yeah, sorry. So there's no parenthesis here. Now, let's look at the set of these guys. And the set of these guys is equal to R0 of k. Um, so. Are not, if I look at the unknot, the fundamental group is just z, and I'm just picking one point on this two sphere. That's all I'm doing. So it's just uh, a copy of that uh, copy of that central two sphere. But what if I take a, a more interesting knot? Well, um, you can figure out what's so what your if you think of the Verdinger presentation, so you know, so we consider conserve Verdinger generators. Right, so think of loops that come in uh, from infinity; they go looping around a. A particular component of the projection. Uh, so here I have generators x, 
X1, X2, and X3 for the trefoil. Um, <coughs> then there, there are the Verdinger relations, which say something like uh, Xi. So the Verdinger relations say that um, as I pass under this guy, the, the generator for X2 gets conjugated by X3. So, um, you know, so this picture, if I have X, sorry, Xi, Xj, Xk, then up to proper choice of which way these guys are going, um, Xk is the conjugate by Xj uh, of Xi. That's the Verdinger relation. And um, you can see, uh, say, in the case of the trefoil, yeah, so what, is, what does that mean? So remember, we're looking at representations where every meridional curve goes to this two-sphere. So each of these guys labels a point on the two-sphere. Let's call that the corresponding points capital X1, capital X2, capital X3. What this relation says, so if, if I look here, so maybe going this way, um, if I conjugate, um, if I conjugate uh, <coughs> x1 by x3, uh, actually, let me, let me draw them like this. I'm going to draw them like this so that it'll be easier to say what I'm going to say. So that relation says, at that circled crossing, it says that if I conjugate x1 by x3, I get x2. What that means, geometrically in this case, is that if I look at this great circle, that, that they lie on a great circle, and these distances are the same. So that this relation, the relation that uh, X3 conjugates this guy. That implies this picture. Okay, and it, if you think about it, what <coughs> um, in the case of the trefoil, all of these relations are the same, uh, and th they have the same consequence. Um, so there's two possibilities: the representation space is I sorry, the representation either sends all three points to the same point, all three. You know, one fair solution to this equation is that x1, the images of x1, x2, x3 are all equal. Then th they all commute, so there's nothing to, to check. Another solution is that there are three uh, symmetrically distributed points on an equator, on a, on a great circle. That's another solution. You can check that the three relations imply the same thing. So the representation space of the trefoil has two components. There's a two-sphere, all the same. <coughs> Union, well, three, uh, three ordered points on an equator. If you think about it, that, that, that's just, um, you can you know, pick where x1 goes, then you know, uh, you know, pick where x1 and x2 go. That tells you where x3 has to be already. And x1 and x2 together, they're points on, on a great circle, ordered points. So that's a copy of the unit tangent bundle of the two-sphere, uh, a copy of SO3, or RP3, let's say. <coughs> um, now you can keep going with these examples a bit. And, um, you can show that if you have, uh, you know, a, and you can compute these for a lot of examples. But if you take a, a you know, a, a two n torus knot, then this representation variety of a two n 
torus knot. So there's two, two strands which get twisted around n times. Maybe I'll just put a, an n in here. Um, that this is, this representation variety is a copy of the two sphere union um, n minus 1 over 2 copies of RP3. <coughs> okay, so what? Well, um, in Jake's lecture on, on Havana homology, he told you what the Havana homology, I think, of these knots were. And a, as an ungraded gadget, um, let's, we're going to compare. to Havanov. So we notice that the homology of the representation variety of the unknot, well, it's the two sphere, so it's z plus c. Forget about the grading. If I look at the um, homology of r naught of the trefoil, <coughs> um, there's a z plus c from here. And the z homology of RP3 is z, z2, 0, z. So it's z to the fourth plus z2. And here, the homology of the representation variety of the 2n torus knot, well, um, it's z to the n plus 1 over 2 plus n minus 1 copies, n minus 1 over 2 copies of z2. And these are all isomorphic to the corresponding Havana homology. Again, as an un ungraded gadget. So <coughs> um, this is a, a story that cries out for some kind of explanation. Why, why are these groups uh, coincident? Uh, it, it's far too naive, turns out. I mean, you know, sometimes by being naive is great, and you're right. But it turns out to be far too naive that just looking at the homology of the representation variety gives you the Havana homology. But it turns out that once we look at the instanton homology uh, of the chern simons function, whose critical points are these representations, then we can access Havana homology. The, the story is a bit subtle. It's not, that we, it's not that this actually agrees always with Havana homology, but what we can prove eventually is that there's a spectral sequence that starts with Havana homology and converges to the instanton floor homology. And, and in this way, you can play off results uh, in one theory to learn, learn about the other. And um, <coughs> uh, how much do I have? Should I stop at 3 sharp or? A couple minutes. OK, a couple minutes. I'll say uh, there's one other interesting thing that you can think about. I mean, there are infinitely many interesting things that you can think about, but one that I might get a chance to talk about a little bit. <coughs> well. Yeah, it's not two minutes worth of stuff, though. Never mind. I'll just stop. Seems like a good moment.